All right. So thank you guys for coming today. Uh, I know it's it's cold outside. Uh, I know that for sure because I walked here from City Hall. <laughs> Uh, energy efficient though, right? To walk instead of drive. So what I did is made a choice that I was going to invest a little more time into walking here. I could have driven and saved myself some time, right? But I made a different choice that was more energy efficient. And what I hope to uh, give to you guys today is some tips on how you can make some choices about what you do at home to save energy, and by saving energy, you're also saving on your bills because you're paying for that energy, or at least I hope so because I work for the utility company, so I hope you're paying. Uh, but I'm going to teach you how to pay maybe a little bit less. Uh, does anybody want to pay more? You can increase my salary if you want. Yeah, if you really like this presentation, you can increase my salary. All right, so <clears throat> I work for Columbia Water and Light, and we are the city-owned water and electric utility. So if you get a city utility bill, it probably has on it a line for electricity and a line for water. And both of those things come from my department. You'll also see probably, uh, depending on where you live, uh, you might see trash on your bill, you might see a sewer charge on your bill, uh, you might see a uh, storm water feed or some other little fees and stuff to go on there. Um, Primarily, I'm going to be speaking to you today about saving energy. There will be a little section in there that will help with your water bill as well. Um, and then right at the very end, I'm going to briefly, one or two slides, talk about some other things that go along with, uh, with being green. Um, they're not necessarily things that will help you on your bill, but some things that if you came here, you might be interested in as well. Okay, so... So like I said, your utility bill from the city will have electric, water, trash, sewer, and storm water on it. Um, depending on where you live, if you have any uh, natural gas service, so if you have a gas water heater or a gas furnace or maybe even a gas oven or stove, uh, around here Ameren provides that, so you would also get a separate bill from Ameren. They're not connected with the city at all. Um, the energy bills, which are the two I've highlighted in kind of that bluish color there, are the electric bill and the gas bill. Those are the ones that I'm going to focus on today. Um, and your energy bills will vary depending on how big the space is where you live, um, how many people live there, um, how efficient the building itself is, like insulation and things like that. And then appliances, the, the big stuff that you have plugged in. So I'm not really talking about like your cell phone charger and your toaster. I'm kind of talking about your washer and dryer and uh, all those things, the big things. So <coughs> we're thinking about the energy bills right now. So by energy, gas, and electric. So this is sort of a, an average picture um, in this kind of the Midwest region of the country of where people use energy in their home. So it's pie chart broken down. It might be a little bit hard to read some of the numbers on it. Um, but we'll focus on different parts as we go through the presentation. The first one is that giant blue chunk that you see. Right? If you can't read it, it says heating and cooling. Uh, this particular pie chart pegs it at around 43%, depending on where you get the information from. It hovers between 40 to like 53%, somewhere in that neighborhood. So. That's a pretty good uh, average there. Uh, but close to half, close to half of your energy bills. So in the wintertime, if you have a gas heater, that might be your gas bill, might be your electric bill in the summertime. Almost half of it is just keeping your place comfortable by heating up the air or cooling down the air. So the place that you can make the biggest impact is also in that area. and so. Some of the presentations I give, I do with like middle school kids. So I, I, I give them a little sort of math quiz, because I always ask them to look at the computers and the electronics section and the lighting section. Right? So it's 9% and 11%. So together, that's what percent? 20%. So if you had no electronic devices plugged in, and you never turned on the light, your utility bill would still be 80% of what it is now. 
Okay? But what if, what if we could get this chunk down, right, without you losing any comfort? We can get that chunk down. You can still have your lights on, you can still plug in your computer and your cell phone. Your life doesn't change a whole lot, but you can have those savings. So it's a matter of determining what you want to spend your money on. Right? If you want to spend your money on uh, a sauna in the wintertime and uh, an igloo in the summertime, all right, we, can't, we can't stop you from doing that. But that's going to be a large effect on your bill. Um, weather matters to your heating and cooling bill. The idea is, right, and, and we're all in college, so do we understand what the word thermodynamics means? Yes. <laughs> Thermo, heat, dynamics, moving. Thermodynamics is the study of how heat moves. And when heat moves from a place that has a lot of it to a place that has less of it, so right now, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like 20 some degrees outside Fahrenheit. And it's it's probably 70-ish in here. So there's like a 50 degree difference from the inside to the outside. So all this heat that's in here would really prefer to be outside so it can balance those temperatures out. Unfortunately, that wouldn't be comfortable for us. So we're, we're fighting this battle, we're fighting a battle of physics, of thermodynamics, to try to keep ourselves comfortable. So the weather matters. If it drops to negative 20 outside, suddenly now the difference between inside and outside is much, much, much bigger. It's like 90 degree difference. So the bill would go up, because we're fighting that thermodynamics a lot harder. So if you see a bill, if we had a really nice December and a really awful January, your bills would be very different, even though those two months might be right next to each other, and you might think they wouldn't be that different. The idea is that the more your system has to run, your furnace or, or your air conditioner in the summertime, the more it has to run, the more energy it uses to do that. The more energy it uses, the more you pay for it. <coughs> but our goal is comfort. So we have to figure out how we can achieve comfort, <coughs> but make the system run less. Right? And so here are some, some ways you can do that. Right? Use a blanket, put on a sweatshirt, your feet are cold, and get some like house slippers or something like that. Those things are helpful to make you comfortable without having to heat the whole house. Right? If I'm comfortable right, where I'm sitting or where I'm working, does it really matter if it's comfortable across the room for me? Maybe not so much, right? If you're moving around and going lots of places, maybe it is, right? So if you can figure out a way to use a blanket or put on a sweatshirt and then turn your thermostat down a couple of degrees, you're still comfortable, but the system is running less. Uh, using a ceiling fan might be a good idea. So most people don't think of turning their fan on in the winter time, but it can actually be useful. Um, if you can get your fan on a gentle setting, so don't like doesn't have to be a helicopter taking off in your living room, right? Just a gentle breeze setting. What you want to do, right, in the winter time, is blow air from the floor up toward the ceiling gently, because what does hot air want to do? Rise. Right, it's like a hot air balloon, right? Right, so your hot air is up up at the ceiling, right? So unless you are, you are nine feet tall. Right? You're probably not experiencing the benefit of all that hot air that's at the ceiling. So if you can get that, if you can, we can create what's called an updraft, right? blow the air up, all that hot air will be forced back down into the room. It might be more comfortable. And I know, personally, I like to feel a little bit of air movement when I'm around. Otherwise, I feel kind of stuffy, even if it's a comfortable temperature. I kind of want something moving. So that gentle fan creates just a kind of a warm breeze almost in your room. Um, some people like to use a space heater. The other thing I caution you about space heaters is remembering to turn them off when you leave the house. It can be pretty dangerous to leave them on when you're not there. Um, you, you basically, it's basically like the same thing that's going on in your toaster. So you wouldn't leave your toaster on, don't leave your space heater. Um, but both of those things are basically 
targeting the heating and cooling to you, the people who need to be comfortable, instead of the whole house. I was telling somebody earlier, my couch does not care how cold my house is. My kitchen countertops don't care how cold my house is. The only people who care, the only things that care about how cold or warm my house is, is the people who live in it. As long as we're comfortable, we're okay. If we can target the heating and cooling on ourselves instead of the whole house, our system will run less. Uh, thermostats. I mentioned this word earlier. So there's that therm again from thermodynamics, okay. right? Um, and then and then stat, which is like uh, like static, uh, which is like not moving. So it's sort of, it's, it almost sounds like the opposite of thermodynamics, but it's not. Um, thermostat. It lets you set a temperature. That's the idea. Set a temperature, and that's what your system will try to achieve. They're not magical. They don't just like sort of figure out how hot it is in your house just by guessing, right? They're sensing the temperature of the air around the thermostat. So if you can find your thermostat on the wall, pretend this poster is a thermostat, what it's doing is it's got like a little thermometer sensor on it and it's just picking up the temperature of this air around it. Which means if I put a little table under here and put a lamp on this table, what's the thermostat think? It's a lot warmer than it is. That, that the whole room is hot, right? Because its sensor is right here and now there's a, this lamp giving off heat, right? If the thermostat thinks the room is hot in the wintertime, it's going to turn off your furnace. If it turns off your furnace, you are going to get cold. So you might be confused as to why the furnace is going up and you're cold even though the thermostat is set to the temperature you want it to be. You just have to remember that the thermostat is working on the principle of measuring the air that's next to it. Um, if you put a heater, like if you have a space heater, you put it right underneath the thermostat. Do the same thing. So be careful about what you put next to the thermostat. It's just sensing the air, trying to make your room that temperature by turning on and off the heating and cooling system. So what should you set it at? Uh, Energy Star recommends. <coughs> right, and I always preface these numbers with that phrase. Energy Star recommends. This is the same program that like gives certifications on refrigerators and all that kind of stuff. Federal Energy Star program. They say when you're home in the winter time, you should have the thermostat set at 68 degrees. How many people have their thermostat either there or lower than 68? people prefer it to be a little higher than that. It's okay, right? I used to live with a roommate who, I think he thought the thermostats were magical or something, that when he hit the buttons, he was instantly going to be more comfortable, because he would come home on a hot day and crank it down to like 58. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> it's going to take forever for the room to get that cold. Um, so they say 68, right? But the way I like to think about it is that if that's your goal, the closer you can get to 68, or lower, if you want to go lower than that, that's fine. But if you're higher than that, the closer you can get to it, the better off you are. When nobody's home, remember, we're heating and cooling for us, not for the stuff in our house, 60 degrees. Right? And my rule of thumb on this is that if nobody's going to be home for about two or three hours, then, then you can go ahead and change the thermostat setting. If you and your roommate are home and you're just going to go run to uh, Hy-Vee and pick up some Chinese food and come right back, no need to change the thermostat. You're going to be fighting with it to get comfortable when you get home if you mess with it. So two or three hours is usually my rule of thumb. There's no real recommendation on that right now. Um, if you have a programmable thermostat, you can preset all of that. So if you can figure out when people leave to go to work or go to class and when people are going to come home, you can preset all those settings into the thermostat and it will automatically raise the temperature up and down to match your comfort level. Um, some people don't have programmable thermostats. At that point, you just kind of have to figure out who leaves first, who leaves last, all that, and, and change the settings that way. But just like, like I told you, walking here was a choice I made to be more energy efficient, right? Changing the thermostat settings is a choice you're going to have to make if you want to be more energy efficient. 
Um, the next biggest chunk on this pie chart is water heating. They peg it at somewhere around 12%. Um, so heating up water is a very, very energy intensive process. When you turn on uh, a burner on your stove, pretty quickly it gets orange and you can feel the hot air if you put your hand next to it, right? All right. Now, put a pot of water that you got out of the faucet on there, how quickly does it take for that water to get hot? A long time, right? So all that energy that you're running that burner on is going into that water. Heating up water takes a lot of energy. So how can we maybe make some savings there? Well, the big users of hot water are showers, dishwashers, and laundry. Right? Running the water to brush your teeth, I mean, if you brush your teeth with hot water, it's a little bit weird. It's okay, do your own thing, you do you. Um, showers, dishwashers, and laundry. So you can take shorter showers, right? Again, I you I present the middle school kids a lot, I always have to emphasize that we do tell them to take showers. Please do take showers, okay? But if you can shave off 30 seconds, 45 seconds a minute, if you like to take really long showers, shave off a couple of minutes, um, that's all that hot water that you're saving. Right? And on top of that, right, you're also paying for the water. And the way the city of Columbia does it, to bill you for your sewer charge based on how much water you use. So you can, in the city of Columbia, you can save hot water. You are saving three different places on your utility bill. Right, so pay attention to this section if you care about those savings. Taking shorter showers is important. Washing full loads in your dishwasher and your washing machine, right? Unless you are an expert at figuring out all the different settings on the washing machine and dishwasher to run different size loads, just wash full loads only, right? Now, that's probably easier to do with dishes than it is with laundry, at least it is for me. Um, so, collect things, sort things out, schedule your use of the dishwasher and the washing machine so you can maximize their potential use for full loads. And while you're washing clothes, uh, cold water is better for your clothes, mostly, and better for energy use. So I tend to wash all my clothes in cold water. Uh, the caveat there is that every once in a while, you probably should run your washer with some hot water in it. Uh, it helps clear any like detergent buildup or anything like that that's in your washing machine. So. Um, Every once in a while, it's cool to use hot water. It's okay to use hot water. Um, but cold water is uh, what I use regularly to do my laundry. Um, I'm gonna skip lighting, uh, mostly because I think at this point, we probably all understand why CFLs are better than incandescent light bulbs. So CFLs are the curly ones. Right? They're a little bit more expensive to buy, but they use only about a fifth of the energy. So they only use like 20% of the energy. So they pay back for themselves really quickly. And then the other option is LEDs, which are more expensive than CFLs, but they pay back even quicker. So you can make some lighting choices. Uh, depending on where you live, you may not be able to replace those. So I decided I was going to skip lighting today. But, uh, so computers and electronics is next. If you live in a place where you have especially more than one person, chances are you probably have more than one computer, possibly more than one TV, possibly um, more than one entertainment device like a DVD player or an Xbox or an Apple TV or something, right? So when there's more than one person in the house, these things can start adding up quickly. Everybody has their own TV in their bedroom, and all of them have an Xbox hooked up. Right? This is probably more than 9% for those people. This is the average for everybody. Gaming consoles are energy hogs. Right? They're better than they used to be. They still take a lot of energy. If you think about what you're doing on it, right? constantly 
rendering new graphics and, and making new sounds and, and processing and saving and, and it's got all these <coughs> layers of stuff going on. It's using a lot of energy to do that. If possible, if you're just watching a movie and pulling up Netflix, if possible, use a DVD player, a laptop, or some kind of streaming device like a Roku or an Apple TV or Chromecast or one of those kind of things. Um, so that you can avoid turning on that energy hogging game console to do that. Um, the other thing you want to do is avoid pausing either a video game or a movie or TV for a long time. Because your system is having to store everything in memory while that's going. So you're using a lot of energy there too. Um, some, some tips for your laptop and phone. Um, you can change the display, <coughs> display settings on your laptop um, to, to go into sleep mode, so it'll just sort of make the screen go black. Um, with my laptop, I also have to log in when it goes on to sleep mode, so it's actually a security setting as well as an energy saving setting. You can also make it go into standby mode after 30 minutes, which basically takes it all the way off, powers it all the way down, so you have to wake it up and type in your password and all that good stuff. Um, so those are the, the time recommendations. Um, screen savers don't save any energy. Again, if you're rendering graphics and things and using energy. Unplug your laptops and cell phones when they're done charging. Right? You ever reached and felt your cell phone or your laptop charger and it was hot? Where do you think the heat came from? electricity out of the wall turn into heat. Um, you can unplug those things. That electricity isn't going to be coming through and heating up that adapter or, or charger cord. Um, turn on the brightness. That helps. Um, this is also a good suggestion for uh, toward the end of the night. Blue light, like that white blue light that comes out of your computer screens or your phone screens, um, tends to wake people up to help think, make your body think it's early in the day. So if you can turn down the brightness, right, it would be easier to fall asleep. So save energy, get better sleep. Um, things on your phone, like the location settings or the Bluetooth, you can turn those things off. You want your phone isn't constantly trying to make sure those things are, are working. Um, so you can turn those off. and then. I don't know. I just threw this on here because I thought of it, but I always check my cell phone to see what time it is. So every time I turn the screen on, I'm using energy. So get a watch. I was going to add for the laptop right mm -hmm. now, there's a program called Blocks. Yes. Um, it sets itself automatically for sunrise and sunset in your area, so you don't have to think about messing with your brightness setting. It starts dimming it and switches it to an orange really useful for me and several other people I know. Yes. I have Flux on my laptop. And so you not only does it preset the sunrise and sunset times, you can also tell it when you're going to go to bed or your average bedtime. And it'll start moving toward red instead of blue the closer it gets to bedtime. So, and the thing for me is if I'm just checking Facebook or something before bed anyway, it doesn't really matter if it looks bright white or a little bit red. Um, you can use power strips to do this. This is not a suggestion that I use a lot, although I did use this around Christmas time when I had my tree and everything plugged in. Um, power strips can help you eliminate vampire energy usage. Some people call it phantom loads, so they end up with these scary names, and it's not that scary, but um, it's when the device or the appliance is still using energy even when it's off. So, like your cell phone charger. It may not be charging a phone, but if that little brick is still hot, it's still using energy. That's vampire energy. How do you know if that's happening? Well, that electricity is probably going to be turned into one of three things. So, think back to your science classes. Energy, never be created or destroyed only transform, right? And so when we're talking about electricity in our house, it's probably going to be transformed into one of three things, heat, light, or sound. 
So something is hot, using energy. Something is making noise, using energy. Something has some kind of light on it, it's using energy. So that little <coughs> red light, or whatever that says, mean, says it means it's off, something's powering that red light. Um, you can use smart strips, which is what I have in this third bullet point here, where one button can turn off everything. So the way they tend to work is that there's one master plugin. And so if you plug your TV into the master plugin, and then plug your cable box, your DVD player, your Apple TV, your Xbox, and your Nintendo into all the other ones, that is what my entertainment system consists of. Um, if you plug all those into the other ones, then whenever you turn the TV off, with the power button on the remote, everything else goes off automatically. Right? You don't have to think about turning all of these things off. Right? If you don't if you don't want your cable box to go off, if that would cause problems with you resetting the channels or whatever, don't plug it into the master power strip, plug it in somewhere else, and you're good to go. Um, they also make timers. I bought a little timer, just plugged into an outlet, and it could, I can set it for 30 minutes, I can set it for three hours, or I can set it for six hours. And what I do is when I go to bed at night, I plug my laptop into that, and I set it for three hours. After three hours, my laptop is definitely fully charged, and then the outlet goes off. It won't let it draw any more energy. So my laptop is fully charged, sitting there all night long, but I'm not drawing any energy, and so my little rip is not hot. So that's basically the, the big tips for energy savings that I want to throw out. I know because at, at this point in your life, like I said, you probably don't have a lot of control over what appliances are in the house. Probably not buying your own washer and dryer and dishwasher and all that right now. So I'm not going to go into those. Um, energy Star labels is a good place to start with those. What you can do right, is um, of the handouts I gave you, the big sheet basically just covers tips. A lot of things I've set up here, a couple of additional things as well. Um, there are some things at the bottom of that list uh, that you might have to ask your landlord about if you have permission to do those things or not. Um, on the back side of that, it says finding an energy efficient rental. Uh, we've also put together some tips on what you should be looking for if you're interested in finding a place that's energy efficient. So if you're planning on coming to the housing fair next week, and you want to ask all these complexes and, and places that you're thinking about living uh, to try to figure out maybe some of the things they already have set up for you in an energy efficient way, that's kind of the tips and things you might want to ask for. Um, the, what was the biggest chunk of the bill on that pie chart? Heating and cooling. So what are the, some things that you might want to ask them about? The air conditioner. Uh, are the air conditioners new? Are they efficient air conditioners? Um, do people complain about the parts being drafty? Heating and cooling things. I want to know if it's true that trying to get up and down and save you more money is that's kind of where that rule of thumb about how long people are going to be gone comes into play. Um, in the winter time, it is probably not a good idea to turn it all the way off, um, especially like right now when it's below freezing a lot. Um, you don't want to end up with any frozen pipes or anything like that in your house. So I would say in the winter time, probably not a good idea to turn it all the way off. In the summertime, that's less of an issue. Uh, just remember that if it's all the way off, then when you, while you've been gone all day, the house has just been getting hotter and hotter and hotter and hotter, so it's gonna take longer for it to catch back up. It kind of depends. Um, you probably wanna, if you're gonna turn it all the way off, I would say only if, you, only if no one's gonna be home like all day, like nine, 10 hours at a time. Um, the other thing you can do, right, in addition to asking the landlords about the complexes, is you can actually go online. You can find out exactly what the people who have been living in that place have been paying on their electric bill. 
All right. The only downside to this is that you can't see the gas bill. So the winter numbers might be a little deceiving. <coughs> but you can at least find out the summer numbers, because air conditioners would be electric. <coughs> I also gave you a little blue business card. Okay. So on there, it reminds you what it's for. And then on the side, that's like solid blue. Because all you have to do is go to GoColumbiaMo.com, which is the city's website. And there's a search box at the top, and you just type in rental utility data. I could have given you the URL, but it's complicated. It's like a government website. It has like eight categories and slashes and underscores. And so this is easier, right? So search rental utility data. What will pop up is a result for like C historical utility usage for rental properties, something like that. You can either look on a map, right? So this is a map of the domain. Um, you can do it that way, and you click on the dot that's the place you want to see. Or you can search by address. Uh, either way, once you find the unit, you can see the past three years of electric and water data. Right? Now, um, some of these apartment complexes don't have individual water meters on each apartment, so you may not have the water data. Like the domain, I think, was that way. You couldn't see the water data. Uh, but you could see the electric data. It will tell you at the top of the page whether it is heated with electricity or gas, so you will know uh, if you need to try to figure out a gas bill or not. If you are really curious about it and you do want to figure out the gas bill, um, what you would need to do is, is get in touch with Amron and talk to them and see if you can get some data. You should be able to get some. I don't know how far back they'll give it to you. I don't know how specific they'll be about it. But uh, you can obtain that information, which is not quickly online. Um, like Jordan mentioned at the beginning, we are competing for $5 million. Um, it's part of the Georgetown University Energy Prize competition. Um, there's all the other cities that we're competing against. There's only one other one in Missouri. Uh, it's Bates County. It's south of Kansas City, north of Springfield there. Um, but as you can see, we have lots of states represented, lots of different communities on there. Um, it would be awesome for us to win. Um, I encourage you to learn more about this. Join the presentation two weeks from now. Um, see what you can do. Um, I imagine that the folks coordinating this at the city will also be sharing some energy savings tips. Um, let's see what else. OK. So I promised I'd briefly talk about what else you could do to go green. We have some recycling uh, slash solid waste management opportunities coming up. Uh, here soon at the city. Um, it is not too late to sign up for a training this Saturday. Right? If you can't make that, there's also one on March 7th, a month from this Saturday, at the ARC um, on, what is that, ASH and the scales. Mm -hmm. um, and it is a recycling ambassador training. <coughs> I went through this training. Uh, what they do is in about that two hour session, they teach you basically how the city manages our solid waste, what we recycle, why, where those things go, um, how you can help us figure out how to get more people to recycle, all of those things. Um, it's a really interesting training if you're sort of interested in, uh, in sustainability, in going green, in uh, like how cities work, if you're studying um, even like marketing or communications, learning how we can maybe help communicate those things. A lot of different fields this could be valuable for. So you can seek out that information. If you want more, I have an email address so that I can uh, send your way, or you can go to the city website and find out. Um, I think this website that's listed on here, comotrash.com, is a project that the city has put together. Um, I think they're still working on some of the pages, so there's a lot of coming soon pages on there. But hopefully around, around this weekend, I think they hope to launch. Um, the city is also having some different input sessions around town for uh, solid waste, so meaning trash and recycling. Um, they're looking for citizen input about what would work best for different folks. So, 
In other words, what would make you recycle more? Would you be interested in moving to a system of carts instead of bags? Uh, why do you use or not use certain bags? What they want is input so they can design a system that works for people. Um, so again, if that's something you're interested in, check out comotrash.com. They're all over the city at different times and dates, so I didn't throw them up here. Um, if your water bill, if you, if you get a city water bill, or really any water bill, but um, if it shows more than about three CCFs per person, and you think, what is a CCF? A CCF is about 750 gallons. It stands for 100 cubic feet, 100 cubic feet of water. So three CCFs, or 300 cubic feet of water, if you get a bill in a month, and let's say there are two people in your place, and the bill is 10 CCFs, that's five a piece. That's a lot of water. In fact, that's way higher than the average that we see the average person using. So if you show more than three per person on your bill, uh, get in touch with either me or there should be an email address or a phone number or something on that big sheet uh, for water and light. Um, it could be a water leak. It could be a water metering issue that's going on, and we definitely would want to check that out. Um, now, don't don't try to pretend it's a leak if you've just done uh, eight loads of laundry per day for the last two weeks. Okay, <laughs> but. Um, if it's, if it's more than three CCS per person and you can't figure out why that might be, give us a call. Um, I think that that's, that, that's it. Um, we do have a Facebook page, right? Uh, Facebook.com slash Powerful Partnership. We also have a Twitter, Como Waterlight. And we have a YouTube channel, CWL Video. Uh, if you have a question, if something comes to mind, if you uh, are curious about something, if you just want some tips, some reminders shot out to you a couple of times a week, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. I run those things. I try not to bombard people with useless stuff. It's just quick little tips, reminders about what's going on in the energy or the water world. Uh, there might be events coming up, things like that. Um, four times a week or so, four or five times a week, I'll put something on there. So if you're I promise your news feed will not be filled with spam from Columbia Waterline. Um, that is my email address and phone number. I also have some cards up here if you are wanting to get in touch with me. Um, questions? I know some people might have questions that they don't want to ask everybody, so I'll stick around for a little, while, a little bit and you can talk to me individually if you want. Other than that, I am done. Thank you, Thank you for coming.